All right. So for Matthew chapter 7, we're continuing with um, the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 7, starting verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do for you. This sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. What do you think? Um, we're getting towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and I have been struck by how personal Jesus seems to get towards the end of this um, amazing sermon that he delivers. Uh, he begins to conclude his sermon, and as he's bringing it to a climax, it, it, it starts to draw all of us, each person, towards action. That's what he's really doing, is pulling us towards now, respond to what I've said. He's pulling us towards action. And frankly, he's pulling us towards decision. Decision. All of this fabulous moral, ethical teaching uh, about life and discipleship, it boils down to each of us personally and individually. That's where it all ends. That's where it lands, sort of in our laps, to make some decisions about this, to, to take some action upon this. And here in this passage, we see this whole series of these action words, right? Ask, that's an action word. Seek, knock, enter. Ask, seek, knock, enter. That's what Jesus is now beginning to clue, conclude with by challenging us to ask and seek and knock and enter. And those are the words that we're going to focus on today. Jesus begins to wrap up this sermon by urging us, really. And, and the people that he's speaking to on this day when he delivers this message, urging them to ask and to seek and to knock on the door of a good and loving God who cares for us like a father would care for his children, right? That's the invitation here. And I love it that we sang that song, Good, Good Father. If you, can, if, if you like that song, and if you can remember the words of that song, it, that song really summarizes everything that I'm going to say here. I'm just going to sort of expand upon this passage and that song. And he urges us, frankly, to choose to enter onto a path of life that, here's, here's what it is, he urges us to enter onto a path of life that God will open up for us, right? A specific path of, right, of life, a right path of life, the right path of life. And even, if I read this correctly, even in exclusion of all other paths of life in favor for this one particular path of life that God opens up for us, which really is not just a path of life, it's the path to life, to, to more life, to real life, to all that life is intended to be. And that is what Jesus plainly calls us to do as we're coming to the end of this Sermon on the Mount. Um, choose. Choose and trust in God as we choose. That's really what he's asking us to choose, frankly, to choose to trust in God for all of these things. That he will provide for us what we truly, truly need in life and for life. And that through his son, Jesus, God will lead us onto that right path that leads to life. Right? So let's, let's consider this. First of all, let's consider the first three words, ask, seek, knock. They don't conclude with the last word, enter. Okay, so ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Here Jesus is quite passionately urging us, I believe, to trust that, that we can believe him to do for us all that we need to be done for us. Uh, the things that we can't 
govern and control ourselves that we can trust God with. And even the things that we can control, that we give them more into God's hand. Uh, to trust that, that there is a God, that we have a God who will hear us and who is in fact good and wants to do good things for us. Who's, who's even able to do good things for us. Because sometimes I think we doubt that. And maybe in here we don't doubt that, but I think sometimes in practical actions, we seem to doubt that, that he really hears us, that he really is good and wants good for us, and that he's really able to deliver on the good for us. And Jesus is urging us not to doubt that, right? But to trust him and to ask and to seek and to knock on his door. Um, It's almost like I get the feeling like Jesus is urging us to give it a try. Come on, you guys, try this. Or or like the psalmist says in the psalm, taste and see that the Lord is good. Give it a try and see how good it really is and that it really works. Take him at his word. Test him on this, if you will, and see if it's not so. It seems as though Jesus is speaking to people who have lost some measure of faith in a God who actually hears them and actually answers their prayers for good. Can you relate to that? Yeah. And maybe for some of these people, because these aren't people who are unfamiliar with God. These are the Jews. They they have already, I mean, just 2,000 years ago, when Jesus delivers this, they already have a few centuries of history. No, a few millennium of history with God. And it almost seems like Jesus is picking up on the fact that somehow they have lost some level of faith and trust in God. And you know, maybe, maybe it's the cruelty of the world that has caused them to fear that God is either not listening or maybe if he is, maybe he's really not all that good <laughs> to be trusted with answering these questions or these concerns for them and that he'll really help them in ways th- that they expect. So maybe what's the use in praying? I've tried that, didn't work out so well, right? Or maybe they've just got these answers that they're insisting upon being delivered in their asking, and they're not getting those. And maybe that's what's confounding them, frustrating them. Or, or maybe a lot of them have sort of worked life out themselves, you know? And, and, and they've become somewhat successful, at least in a moderately functional sort of way with their own manipulating of life, bargaining in life, earning, figuring, forcing, fighting, factoring out life for themselves. And they've come to some sort of a level of some sort of mediocrity and, and satisfaction with that in the way they've sort of set life up to be for themselves. And, and, and they're just sort of stuck there. You know, whatever the case may be, the result is that there's not so much trust, it seems, anymore. There's, there's not so much faith. And because of that, there's not so much seeking. There's not so much knocking. There's not so much asking anymore. The bottom line is there's not so much prayer anymore. And, and because of that, there's not so much in the way of answers anymore. Now, you realize that? If you stop praying, you stop getting answers too. And that's what Jesus is trying to challenge them with. And without faith, there's not much hope for our prayers. Without faith, there's frankly not really much reason for our prayers. And therefore, we don't pray so much. And if God is not all that good, or not listening, or not willing to help if he can help, why pray to him? And if doubt increases, you know, through that, then we soon are left wondering, I think, that takes us to this place of really wondering if there's even a God at all to pray to. I think that's where that kind of lands us in the end. If we can't even begin to believe that God is there and that he is good and that he is trustworthy, why would we pray? And why would our prayers prayed in such a way in in a level of doubt and unbelief, why would they even be answered? Well, James, the apostle, writes this about that. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all, 
without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe (laughs) and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not think that they will receive an answer from the Lord. They're really not expecting one anyways. So surely we have to start, at least start with some measure of faith that God hears, that he cares, that he's good, and that he'll answer. And, and I would say that it, it, even if it, it, all it needs to be is the tiniest step, the tiniest stretch, the, the littlest mustard seed size of faith to believe in God, that he'll answer. That's all that's asked of. And he'll answer. And you know, the other thing that Jesus makes pretty plain here is that God's not out to trick us. He's not out to deceive us. So that if we ask for one thing with some sort of cruelty or perhaps mischievousness, he'll actually give us the opposite. Or something that looks like what we asked for but is actually really useless. So that if we ask for bread, he's not going to give us a stone that looks like a loaf of bread. Just And, and ha ha ha, what a joke. Or or if we ask for a fish, give us a snake, just to toy with us. He's not going to do that. I mean, Jesus is urging us to understand and believe that our Heavenly Father is not like that. Because that wouldn't be a good father. And he is a good father. I mean, we can generally, and Jesus notes this, we can generally trust earthly fathers to give them at least reasonably good gifts to their children. Generally, right? And if that's the truth, then how much more? How much more should we be able to trust God to give us, his children, genuinely good gifts? And you know, it occurs to me that a lot of the times our doubt doesn't necessarily come from some some one point in time massive crash of faith that suddenly, one day, doubts the existence of God. It usually doesn't work like that. Rather, it seems to come much more subtly and slowly upon us, is what I've noticed. It almost always seems to start with a slow erosion and shaking of our confidence that, you know, leaves us thinking, well, maybe God really doesn't hear me. Maybe, because I don't seem to be getting the answers that I'm looking for. Or, Or maybe he won't answer me the way that I really want him to answer and I think that often is a process that stops us from going to God is this idea of well I'll ask God but what if he doesn't give me what I want (laughs) maybe I'm better off just not asking him and I'll just try to get it myself because I've tried this before and I actually didn't get what I asked for and that can be disheartening for us especially when we didn't get the answer that we really felt like we needed and wanted. And that can cause us to sort of give up hope and give up praying. Right? And and again, I think, even with that scenario there, it really boils down to this issue of trust. The real thing is, is can you trust God? to give you what really is good for you, rather than just what you wanted or expected. Right? Can you really trust him with whatever his answer is when you ask? And that because that's what his answer was, it is therefore by definition good. Because that's the only way he answers in what is good and right. And that's a big level of trust, isn't it? We can't, you see, we can't just trust in the answer that we think we need or want. We've got to trust in the God, not in the answer. If we trust in the God, then the answer will be good no matter what. The trust has to be in the God who is good, not in the answer that we're expecting. Right? The trust is not in the provision, it's in the provider. It's not in the gift. It's in the giver. And just this absolute belief that because the giver is good, the gift will be good. Because the provider is good, the provision will be good. 
no matter what it is. That's what's being asked of us. You know, nowhere really does Jesus say or guarantee that if we ask in faith and trust, we'll get whatever we want according to what we want and according to the desires that we have. That's actually not what we're ever promised. Or that God is somehow at our beck and call for whatever we ask according to our will. That is some sort of a mystical, religious, mysterious magic wand that we can ask. And if we just ask believing enough, we're going to get it, period. No matter what we want. That's silly. Really. It's not like that at all. And in 1 John, the epistle of 1 John, John even addresses exactly this. He says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything, wait, according to his will, John says, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. And it will be the best for us because it's his will. Remember, the prayer is thy kingdom come and thy will be done. I know I'd like it to, often I'd like it to be my will be done, but it actually doesn't say that. It says thy will be done. Listen to this. You might have heard this before. I find this to be quite profound. Uh, I don't even know who wrote this, Um, but here it is about prayer. Someone writes, I ask for health that I may do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for strength that I may achieve. I was made weak that I may learn to obey. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power and the praise of men. I was given weakness to sense my need for God. I asked for all things that might make me enjoy life. I was given life that I may enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but everything I hoped for. In spite of myself, my prayers were answered. In spite of my requests, my prayers were answered. My ask, my seek, my knock, my prayers were answered. You know, we may ask amiss, but God always answers a right, is the moral there. He always gives us what is ultimately our true need. It's not us, right? Or I'm sorry, it is us. It is us who is called to ask of him, not to tell him, right? It is us who is called to seek him out, not to beckon him over here, God, I need you, but to go seek him out and his will and his righteousness. It is us who is called to knock on his door, not to kick it down and take the house over. (laughs) Right? That's the perspective I think that we really are challenged with here. You see, the invitation here is for us to give our requests to God, for him to do what is right with them. It is for us to seek him out and to ask him to open our doors and give all of that over to him and where it ends up and where he takes it, give that over to him in faith. And the promise then is that he will take those and do what is best and right with them for us. We're called to trust him in that. And that will always, always be answered. And you know what? It very well might not turn out to be the way we thought it would turn out. (laughs) It actually might not be the particular answer we were hoping that it would be or the request that we specifically were asking for. To tell you the truth, I was thinking about this this morning, there are a number of things that immediately come to my mind that I have to thank God for that he didn't answer the way I wanted them to. You know? Have you ever thought of that? And I'm so grateful that he said no to that. 
There's a lot of things that would have gone sideways in my life if he had just said yes to it all. I don't want that. I only want what he wants for me. Even if it doesn't turn out the way I might have thought or imagined or even wanted it to, I know that'll turn out what's best if I continue to seek and ask and knock. That is his promise. I mean, you'll think about it. Even with the analogy Jesus uses here, even, even earthly fathers don't always just say yes, right? Do they? They don't. And good thing. That wouldn't be right. Because the bottom line is, kids don't really know what they want and what's good for them. And guess what? I'm just a kid like that too. I don't always really know what's good and right for me either. And if I just got every ask, I would be going sideways real quick. I want to show you a film clip. Mallory, you can get that ready. Um, movie I watched a number of years ago. Still think this is the best illustration to help explain this. Um, it is from the movie Bruce Almighty. So if, if, if you watched that movie and it was a bit heretical for you, well, it is a bit heretical. Um, but it really makes an amazing point exactly. The whole movie is about asking God and getting what you ask or not getting what you ask and what's best for you and trusting God with that. That's really what the whole movie is, is about. So Bruce, like, just quick background if you haven't watched the movie, Bruce doubts in God's goodness and in God's ability to handle his life and to answer the way that, that Bruce thinks is best for him. So God basically calls Bruce in and, and, and Morgan Freeman plays God. Does a great, he's got the right voice for it, right? Bottom line is, he's got the right voice for God. He plays God, and he basically calls, beckons Bruce in and says, okay, Bruce, you think you can do better than I can? Go at it. Go at it. You be God for a while and see how well you do with all of this. And the really interesting thing about this is this is actually what God does for us. <laughs> he really says that to all of us. Do you realize that? If you don't want God to be God in your life, God says, fine, you do it. <laughs> that's, a, that's called free will. We all have that right to take that path and to forge our own way and to, and to do it all ourselves. Now, Bruce is just given this quite overtly by God. And here's the, here's the twist on it. Here's the interesting thing, is that Bruce is actually given the uh, ability and some of the powers of God to do this for all other people around too. You get to now, Bruce, choose not, and answer prayers not only for your own life, but for everybody else too. And let's see how it goes. Let's see how you do with all of this. And, and of course, it goes sideways really quick. One of the funny things is that Bruce just, he gets these thousands, thousands of prayer requests coming to him, and he, he doesn't know what to do with them. So he finally says, I'll just, I'll just answer yes to everything. Everybody gets a yes. And he just responds to all of these prayer requests with yes. Thousands of them. And, and, and it's like the next day, like 40,000 people win the lottery. All of them. And they split, they get like, they get like 17 bucks each. <laughs> and on and on it goes. And just imagine what it would be like if everybody got exactly what they asked for in their prayers. And, it, and, and in his own life too. And it just starts getting nuts. So one of the amazing scenes was there's this boy who's being bullied. And uh, he, he's, he has to climb a rope in gym class. And all the other kids are, are just like teasing him because he's a little overweight and he can't do this. And he goes in and the boy prays, oh, God, help me. And, and Bruce says, okay, done. And, and the boy gets the supernatural powers that he can climb the rope like hand over hand faster than everybody else. And all his friends are stunned and blown away by this. And in the, another scene, there's this destitute lady who needs, who is just broke. And, and she, she's in the grocery store and she utters, oh, God, help me. And Bruce goes, okay, done. And, and he causes her to slip and fall. And there's a, 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 a lawyer right there to watch her slip and fall, who then, of course, sues the supermarket. And now she's got tons of money. Problem's all solved, right? So, but take a look at this. This is what happens. We got, do we have sound? How can we get sound? Yeah. Uh, I could bring the microphone over, yeah? Is it easier to just bring a microphone over, Trevor, or can we plug it in real quick? Uh, 
So you still remember the backdrop to the stories? Boy being teased. Now he's got these incredible, incredible power, and no one's going to tease him anymore. Girl or well, lady um, sues and gets tons of money. Filthy something gets. You can always clean it right up. There were so many. I just gave them all what they wanted. Yeah. Since when does anyone have a clue about what they want? You remember Filbert? Yeah, Filbert. What's gotten into him? Brilliant young man. He was going to be a great poet. The soul of his work would have been built around his childhood pain. Now he's headed for a career as a professional wrestler. He will eventually test positive for steroids and end up managing a muffler shop. Lots of disappointment. He got what he prayed for. Esther Maha. I love Esther. Esther was bankrupt. She was going to have to eat her pride and call her sister. That would have gotten the two of them together again. Instead, she bought a condo in South Florida. Oh, there are going to be a lot of these. Just one more. Hey, that's Lance Armstrong. He won the Tour de France. He's won it four or five times in a row. Overcame a lot to do it, too. I didn't. No. Oh, well, that was me and him. You see, Bruce, triumph is born out of struggle. Faith is the alchemist. If you want to paint pictures like this, you have to use some dark colors. So what do I do? Parting your soup is not a miracle, Bruce. It's a magic trick. Those were actually the, the deleted scenes in the movie. And there are a couple of, I think, the best deleted scenes, or best scenes that uh, the movie had to offer, and, and they got deleted. But nonetheless, uh, I found an awful lot of profound truth in that. And I, you know, I love that line, that uh, to paint beautiful pictures in this world, with all of the brokenness and fallity and sin in this world, to paint a beautiful picture with this material, you've got to use some dark colors. And it's true. And here's the truth, that really only God can be trusted with that kind of a paintbrush. You know? Not me. Man, not me. But God, yeah. So yes, ask and seek and knock. And yes, believe. And yes, trust. Oh man, you've got to trust and, and do that all persistently throughout life. You know, work at it. Practice it persistently. You know, give your prayers and your requests to God. And you can be sure, you can be absolutely sure, positive sure, that he will answer you. <laughs> and, yet, and yes, his answers won't always be exactly what you were expecting or wanting, but they will be good in the end, and he will paint and work and build and develop beautiful things in your life. He will, and he does, right? All through life, he will, and he does. He will open doors to life and purpose. He will open doors that lead into his will for your life and amazing purposes that are beyond what you would probably ever even dare to ask for but he'll build it. He'll build it. And he'll walk you right through all of it. That's the promise here. That is the promise. So now let's go on to that other word of enter. To choose to enter. To choose to enter. And Jesus says here, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. I mean, wow. Does that shake you a little bit? 
I, th I think the most striking thing here, and, and without a doubt for many, many people, probably the most offensive thing here in what Jesus is saying is, is how exclusive he seems to be. We don't like exclusive. We like inclusive. But here Jesus seems to be fairly exclusive and he talks about this right road and the right gate to enter into. And it's small, he says. It's narrow and few find it. And it leads to life. It is the one that leads to life. Now there's another way and it's wide. It's broad and many are on it, many. And it leads to destruction. Does that offend you? It can be pretty offensive in our culture though, can't it? It can be hard to hear, especially for us broad-minded, inclusive, all accepting people that we've become. And you know, it, it certainly is a value in our culture and in our day and age to be broad-minded and open. Open to many ways, many opinions, and many possibilities. And you know what? Often, that is a very good thing. Often, that is a very good thing. But is it always a good thing? That's what I would ask. And when it comes to God and who God is and spiritual truth and what truth is, is it always broad and open with many possibilities and basically whatever you choose? And more and more and more, our society, we people, we want the path to God and to salvation and whatever we think salvation is, we want it with few boundaries, right? And, and many broad and tolerant and permissive and wide paths. And we want those to lead to God. In fact, more than anything else today, our society, our world, and maybe even we, here's what I think it boils down to, is we want to be able to define the way ourselves and we want everybody else to have the right to define the way themselves and sort of stamp approval on all of them. If that's what you want, then great. Go for it. Then that's truth. Is it really, though? Is truth really that arbitrary? Especially when it comes to God? I'm not convinced. I know we want to be the masters of our own destinies, and the arbitrators of our own version of truth. There's something very much in us that wants to do that. But is it right? Is it, is it true? We want to be able to pick and choose our gate through which we will enter. We want to pave our own path or road. And we want to be able to pick and choose the course for ourselves from among an unlimited selection that is really only limited by our own imagination and our own wants and wills. But is that really truth? Is that really God? Who creates God? Do we or does God create us? Do we tell God what truth is or does God tell us what truth is? I think it comes down to though, especially about him. <laughs> especially about him. And here, Jesus, I mean, I think I'm pretty right. If, I mean, we can all read it. I think Jesus pretty clearly here states that really, really, there's only two choices. As he paints it here, at least two ways, two gates. And each leads clearly to a different destination. I mean, is that right? Is that what it says? One to life and the other to some kind of destruction. And apparently, that's it. That seems to be it. Now, that might seem breathtakingly narrow, and yes, I suppose it is, <laughs> but that is clearly what Jesus is saying here. He even plainly 
calls his way that leads to life the narrow way. <laughs> so if it seems to be narrow, well, yeah, he even says it is. It's the narrow way. He admits it. And the other way he admits is the broad way, right? <laughs> with everything lumped together. Think of it as like a, a, a mega highway with like 10, 15 lanes. It's the broad way and many are on it. But it leads to destruction in the end. When we run things ourselves, it leads to destruction in the end. When we choose and forge our own course, it leads to destruction in the end. And if you take that story of, of Bruce Almighty, when he gets to do all of that himself, even with the powers of God, it just starts to lead to destruction. Life in his own world and life all around him, it just starts falling apart. And Jesus is choosing us to choose that narrow gate, that limited gate that gives that stuff to God and not to us, right? That trusts God with that. God gets to be God and we don't. That's what he's asking because after all, you know, and, and, and to trust in Jesus, because after all, Jesus is, is going to clearly tell us, as, as you read through the New Testament over and over and over again, he's going to tell us that he, in fact, is, himself is that way. <laughs> he's the way. In fact, he, he, he said, a few cold quotes for you. He, he boldly says it himself later on. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. That, that's him saying he's the narrow way. And on the other occasion, Jesus says this. He says, I tell you the truth, I am the gate <laughs> for the sheep. And whoever enters through me will be saved. He's the way. He's claiming it. And it doesn't matter whether I claim it or not. The fact is that Jesus claimed it. We all have to deal with that, including me. I'm just portraying what, what he actually says in his own words. In another, in another occasion, the Gospel of John, he says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. That's why he qualifies. That's why he qualifies for this. And Peter, the apostle Peter, the apostles say the same thing too, over and over and over again. Peter says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no, no other name under heaven which we have been given by which we must be saved. The name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who you crucified, but who was raised from the dead. That's the other thing that qualifies him. Not only did he give his life for his sheep, he also overcame death for his sheep. There's something pretty unique about Jesus, you see, that qualifies him to be the way, the truth, and the life, to be the path which we must follow. And you know, the bottom line is that if you're going to actually read the New Testament, you cannot escape the fact that Jesus and the New Testament claim, shockingly, exclusively perhaps, that Jesus is that right and narrow gate and path that leads to life in God. There's no doubt that Jesus understood himself to be that narrow way and that that is what we are being called to choose, to choose him, to choose Jesus. And choosing Jesus is choosing life. And, and, and therefore to give up our own way. That's what we're called to give up. Our own way. Our own path. Our own life. Our own understanding of how it should all work and what ultimate truth is. He says, lay that down and choose me instead. You see, that is for God to say. I can't say those things. He can that's for him. That's a God thing to say. Only God can say stuff like that. And he says it. And here's the truth that I've realized throughout my 55 years of life is that I'm not God. Whew. Surprise, eh? I'm not God. I have no right to make those kinds of decisions. I just try to trust him with them. And I know that if I hold on to my own ways, my own path, my own salvation, my own right to choose my own way, 
I'm playing God. And I'm not God. And interestingly enough, God does give us the freedom to choose to do that. But he urges us not to. And instead to give that role back to him and go his way. So, really in the end, what's at stake here is our very lives. That's ultimately what's at stake here. It is a matter of surrendering. I don't, I don't know if that helps you understand it, but I think it really boils down to this whole idea of it's all about surrendering to God. And I would say even surrendering as though unto death. That level of surrendering to God. Here's what it's a matter of. And again, I'm going to quote Jesus again. It's a matter of whoever wants to save his own life will lose it, Jesus says. But whoever loses his life for me, Jesus says, will save it. That's what it's a matter of. It's a matter of trust. (laughs) And frankly, pretty radical trust. To the point of, of giving up and surrendering ourselves in all of this. Here's what it's a matter of. I, I, I feel, I've used this analogy before, I feel like it is a matter of us um, putting all of our eggs for life, for faith, for hope, for salvation, and all that it is and should be, and taking all of those eggs and putting them in the Jesus basket. Like exclusively in the Jesus basket. That's what it's like. All of your eggs for hope, for salvation, for meaning, for happiness, for purpose, for direction, for spiritual life, for full life, for eternal life. Putting all those eggs in one basket that is being held by Jesus and trusting him with all of that. That's what it's like. That's what he's asking us to do. Does that make sense? You know, the really interesting thing about the movie Bruce Almighty, if you haven't watched it for a long time, or if you've never watched it, there's some crude parts in it too. I mean, it is Jim Carrey after all. But uh, if if you can put up with that, watch it this week. Because the way the movie ends is shockingly surprising and profound to me. In the end after Bruce gets to be God and, and just runs his own life amok and runs everybody else's life amok and runs you know, this girlfriend of his, Grace, it's, interestingly enough, her name is Grace, runs her life amok. He finally, in a rainstorm, like gives up. And he's standing on this road with the pouring rain and his life in shambles. And he says, okay, God, I give up. And exactly at that moment, he's hit by a truck. And it's like he dies. And to me, it is just like, I don't know if the movie makers intended this, but it's like the most profound illustration of what we've got to do. We've got to die. We've got to die. You want to know what your role in your salvation is? It's die. Just drop down dead and just let God resurrect you. Let him do everything else. Your job is just to surrender as though unto death. He gets hit by this truck, he's pulled up into heaven, and he's standing before Morgan Freeman again. God. And, uh, and it's like, well, now what? And Morgan Freeman says, how about you try praying now? And he tries this little uh, weak attempt at a prayer. And God says, well, that's a good prayer if you're wanting to be Miss America or something. Because he prays for like peace in the world and good things that happen to everybody. He goes... Pray a real prayer. He says, what do you care about? Who do you care about? And he says, grace. And he starts praying for grace. And he actually prays that grace would not be his anymore. (laughs) He gives her up. And he says, I pray for grace that she would have everything that she really needs. That she would have someone who really loves her and cares for her. Who really takes care of her. And he basically gives the most precious thing and and most desired thing in his life away. And it's actually quite a beautiful prayer. And then Morgan Freeman says, 
Now that was a prayer. And then he takes his two fingers, do you remember this? And he touches Bruce on, on the chest. And it's like, this bolt of shock goes through him. And, and Bruce goes, well, that didn't feel good. And he touches him again, and boom, this other big shock. And woof, back down on earth. And he's on paddles, resuscitation paddles. And he's brought back to life. And guess what he gets? Now he gets the things that he prayed for, but in a much, much, much different way. It required him to change. And C.S. Lewis was famous for saying, I don't pray so that I can change God and his will and purposes for me. I pray that so I can change and conform to God's will and purposes for me. And that's what it took for Bruce. He had to change in order to get the things that he really desired. And that change was painful for him. In fact, it was like death for him because it meant giving up his control in his life, dying to self and giving himself over to the will and purposes of God. And lo and behold, that's what brings back into his life the thing that he so, so desires. But with him no longer in control, <laughs> That's kind of what it's like. That's what God is working in all of our lives. And I think it is so often going to be in such surprising and unexpected and yes, even sometimes painful ways. And God takes the pain of our world and he, he, he weaves it into our lives in ways that actually end up becoming beautiful and strength for us because of the way he works them and works them in our lives. He redeems them is what he's doing. That's what he's doing. He redeems even the broken and painful things in our lives. And one of my favorite stories is uh, J.R. Tolkien's The Silmarillion. If you've not read The Silmarillion, you've got a treat in front of you that you, if you read that. Uh, the first 50 pages of the book is about the creation of the earth. And it follows a lot of the Genesis story. Um, but in one point, um, at sort of the f around the fall of the earth, what happens is some of the, uh, some of the, the, the angels, or the sub-beings in Tolkien's world, um, they want to be like God and create like God does. And, and God is creating everything through music and song, music and song. I mean, Genesis says it's the word of God that created, but then Tolkien sort of takes it a step further. And it's like the song and the singing, the voice, the music of God that creates. And, and, and these fallen angels, they want to create their own world too. And they start singing. And, and instead of a, a beautiful melody, it's like this cacophony of broken, terrible sound. And it's, it's wrecking things. And it's creating not good things, but broken things, bad things. And as God sort of sees this, he doesn't just destroy everything at that point or even the, the broken things that are being created. He actually comes and he overwhelms them with his sound. And, and Tolkien talks about how he gathers up all of this cacophony and broken melodies and terrible sound and he actually uses those to weave them into his own melody. And, and he builds his own melody to redeem that cacophony and bring it into something that's beautiful. It started out as something broken and ugly, but he just grabs it all and he builds now his own song around it and through it and changes it into something beautiful along with what he's doing. He redeems it is what he does. He redeems it. That's what God is doing in so much of our lives where they're broken is he's redeeming them. And he's going to take those broken and painful things and weave them back into his beautiful melody. He's going to take those dark colors and paint them back into something beautiful again. He's going to redeem them if we trust him with it. When we get a hold of it ourselves, <laughs> we tend to make a mess of it. He redeems it. Amen? That's what we have in our God. He is a good, good father. And he loves us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your grace. Because that's what this is, is. It is grace. Thank you for your goodness. God, and, and I, when I really, really think about it, I have to thank you that the road is narrow. That the road is narrow. And, and it must be, I think, because it's your road. It's truth. 
I mean, my way would be to make it ridiculously broad. And I would wander all over the breadth of that. And I would get lost and I would get myself into a mess. I thank you that you narrow it down to the right way. Because I can follow that. Just follow in your path that you lay out before me. The doors that you open for me. I can do that. I can't figure it out myself. But I can follow you in it. God, I don't want to get lost. I want to be in truth. And I want to be in your way. I want your kingdom to come and your will to be done. On earth as it is in heaven. And I imagine that that's a more narrow way compared to what happens here on earth. So I pray for the narrowness of your kingdom come and your will be done. Amen? Amen. Um, so we got two more Sundays here. Two more Sundays here. You know what's happening on the very last Sunday here? Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's Thanksgiving. But uh, I'm not preaching that Sunday. Nate's preaching that Sunday. So we're closing our time here at, up, at Uptown in this building with uh, a, next, a next generation preaching here. And I think that's an appropriate way to wrap it up. And then when we go to the new building, the first Sunday that we're there, which is the 16th, I would really like to do baptisms on the first Sunday that we're there and sort of christen that place too with an opportunity to start out in that building with that kind of a decision, with stepping onto that kind of a road, with that kind of asking and seeking and knocking and entering <laughs> actually happening with a group of us. And I know there's a number of people that I've talked to about baptism who are interested in it, and uh, uh, pray about that. And come and talk to me if you are interested in it. And that will be a Sunday that we want to sort of launch with that. Sarah? Chris? Yes, in Acts 22, uh, when Jesus was leaving earth and uh, ascending into heaven, that's actually what he, he said to us. Um, the disciples asked, well, what are we going to do when you leave? Um, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I, and I want to read to you uh, this morning's header now. And he says, through baptism we say no to the world. We declare that we no longer want to remain children of the darkness, but want to become children of the light, God's children. We don't want to escape the world. We want to live in it without belonging to it. This is what baptism enables us to do. So if you're thinking about that, we would love to, to know and prepare for that. And it's a great way to start off our, our new chapter. Let's stand together as we close our service. So God, we want to just respond to this message of Rogers today, the message that you've given us. Ask, and we will receive. Seek, and we will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. So God, we come before you now, and we ask that we can truly hear your answer to that call as we seek you. You won't be led until you have it all.
Two things. You can get your kids if uh, they are waiting with the teachers in the back there and prayer. Do we have a, do we have a prayer team off to the back wall? So just kind of go into that slide screen there and uh, someone will come alongside and pray for you if uh, that's something that you could use today. Sing another song and then we'll uh, prepare for lunch. <laughs> 